I got out of high school, I barely got out of high school, and I wanted nothing to do with college. I'd moved around a lot, <coughs> so my grades and my academic experience was not positive at all. Uh, I actually had a full track scholarship to uh, Ithaca College that I turned down, and not only did I turn down, I did not tell my parents that I had it because I know that they would encourage me to go to school, and the last thing I wanted to do was to go to more school. I was like, get me out of here. I'm not an academic learner. So when I got out of school, I had this sense. I didn't think I was stupid. I knew I was because my grades told me I'm kind of a D, you know. I frustrated a lot of people. I was a good kid, but, you know, people thought that I was underachieving, and to me that was just like, you know, I'm a loser. So... Uh, thankfully, I had really cool parents that never supported that thought, but, but that was the conversation in, in my head. And we all have conversations in our head that we really have to be careful of what we listen to. You know, we, have to listen, we have to be careful what we allow from the outside to come in as well. But it's that internal question that you really want to stay on top of. So uh, my first job was, like I said, in cable television, and I started as what was called a grunt, and that's a guy that works underneath linemen. You're a, you're a slave. You just run around. You're a gopher. You go for whatever it is you want, they want. Uh, so I did that, but then I learned how to be a lineman. And being a lineman was cool. So I was, you know, 17 when I first became a lineman, then 18, 19, I, I, I got left the construction business, went to a cable television system, started to learn some technology stuff, how to be a service tech, fix it from the TV to the telephone pole. Uh, I was really interested in that, and people were teaching me uh, basic broadband engineering with paper, pencil, addition, subtraction, and helping me to understand it. Um, at that point in that picture, I'm sitting there, and it's 9 o'clock at night, I'm calling into the answering service to see if I have to go out and go to anybody, anybody else's house. Uh, so my hours were pretty crazy. I, I worked a lot of weekends when all my friends were doing what you would expect they'd be doing at 18, 19 years old, and they thought I was crazy, but I was just like, you know, uh, I have a handicap. I'm not that bright, so I have to outwork everybody. So I figured if I did 60 hours a week, with it pretty much every, every week, at the end of a year, I would have a year and a half's experience. At the end of two years, I would have three years' experience. So me getting more experience is going to give me a head start on people who may have more education, okay? So education is really important, but there's a lot of ways to get it. You can get it in this environment and get great education from this environment, but it's not alone. Education is information. Information is not enough. You have to convert that to knowledge. And knowledge is information and experience plus learning from the experiences you start integrating that and the more you do that the more you not only learn but the more you learn how to learn so from there i went to uh, <clears throat> I became a field engineer, I worked on earth stations, I got hired at the age of like 22 to oversee the build of one of the largest, most sophisticated broadband systems in the, in the world that was being built down in New Jersey, hired a bunch of people. Uh, I, had no, I look back on that now and I think, that was an amazing accomplishment. First of all, for them to trust me that much to hire me. But I got to a point in that, uh, in that field where I kind of felt as though I went as far as I could go, I started bumping up against some corporate stuff that didn't work for me. So I got out of that, started my first business. My first business went really well, built it to four and a half million dollars in about six years with offices in four states. And in 1987, at the age of 30, that business crashed. Just like collapsed on itself. I was married. Uh, I had uh, one child, another one about three months from being my second child, I had a mortgage, I had all this stuff, and I just, my, it was all gone. So the question was, the first question I had was, can I fight back that internal conversation that got reactivated that I was a loser? Because I failed. Like, you know what, see? You should have taken MBA classes, you should have went to college, you should have done this, yep, yep, they were right. And it was a real confidence crisis. 
So in that, one of the things that I learned uh, is that there are no failures. There are no failures. What there are are experiences that you wish you didn't have to have, experiences that didn't turn out the way you thought they would. But if you can learn from them, they're not failures. They're a class. What class am I in? So what class did that bankruptcy teach me? Well, it taught me, obviously, a lot about finance. It taught me about how not to build a business so big and so fast that the, the level of its complexity exceeds my ability to manage it. We were really good at what we did. We did engineering. We did construction. We were, <coughs> we were at the top of the game. But when you have a company with offices in four places, it's a heck of a lot more difficult and more expensive to operate than when you have one and one. So that's what we learned. So on the other side of that, I had a big question. What am I going to do? Uh, I have the voice going, failure, failure, failure. But I had this other voice going, I'm not done yet. And that voice almost was absurd to me. What do you mean you're not done yet? I'm, for some reason, it wouldn't go away. Like, I'm not done yet. So I started looking at it because my options were get a job. I was a hot commodity. I'd be very well paid. Or s the absurd thought of starting another company with almost like no money and knowing the IRS was going to come after me and I'd have all these debts and all this kind of stuff. And it, I, I couldn't figure it out. So what happened was, uh, because that voice wouldn't go away, I thought and I said, you know what? If I take a job, I will never start another business because I have a two-year-old daughter, I'm going to have a new son, and I will fulfill my obligation as a parent to make sure I have financial stability, blah, 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 make sure I can pay for their colleges and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. But if I start another business and it fails, I can still go get a job. I might be a little further deeper in debt, but one option allows me to keep two options. So with the blessings of my, of my former wife, who is still my very dear friend, uh, I started a second business. And I took everything that I learned from that first business about perseverance, hanging in there, because that company didn't, didn't go down overnight. It did a slow death for a year. I could see it crumbling. My partners and I were trying to pull it out and look like, you know, the, the, it's like a plane on a trajectory. It's coming down into the mountain and you're hoping you can pull it up before it hits the mountain, but at some point you're past past the point of return. So I learned a lot about stress management. I learned about being in the moment. And I learned about take the next best step and take it from there. So, and I also learned how to deal with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of knuckleheads. Because, you know, IRS people and bankruptcy attorneys, and they're just carnivores, and they're coming after you. You're just a good guy. You're trying to do the best you can. And so anyway, I started this second company. And uh, I decided I was going to change industries from the cable television industry to the technology industry because that was in 88, 87. And that was when the whole technology industry was just starting to boom. We were just starting to come up with, with personal computers, and they were just starting to network them. So I didn't know anything about that stuff, but I had a little bit of an engineering background. I had a construction background. So I said, you know what, let me get into that, and I will learn as I go. Because one thing I know about me is, is I'm an applied learner. Uh, Show it to me, I'll get it, and then I can go back and I can do the research and I can read and I can figure out the design and the engineering and, and that type of stuff. But I, I have to get my, my hands in it. So I jumped into that industry and, uh, boy, we bumped around for about nine, nine years and I was struggling to break a million dollars. And it just was, we're doing really good work once again, but financially it was tough. And, again, this loser what are you doing, man? Nine years, there's other people in this business that are just raking in the money, and you're not. But I was just like, this is what it is that I have to do. So all of that pressure on loser, right? What that started to make me do, because one thing about me is I don't give up. I learned nobody can ever make me give up. I can choose to stop doing something, but nobody ever, ever can make me give up. That's the ultimate empowerment thought. And that will get you through things that you never, ever thought you could get through to get to a point that you always wanted to get to. Now, there's times you stop doing something because they don't work for you. But that's not giving up. That's making a smart decision to find what, what better things life has for you. 
So I started looking and saying, okay, so what am I not good at? Well, I'm really not good at accounting. I mean, I learned how to do it, but I hate doing it. So when I do it, it takes me three times as long. And when I'm spending three times as long in my company doing that, I'm not spending that time doing what I'm really good at in my company. So my company's not getting the best of me. So I hired somebody to come in and do that. She turned out just to be a total find. Uh, she worked with me for, well, she's still there. And uh, she ended up going to Bryant to get her MBA, working full time with me, which was probably at least 50 hours a week. And she got her MBA with a 4.0 from Bryant. That's who I ended up hiring. Like, wow. So she came in, she took the finances. That I then found a young sales guy. Uh, he came in, because I wasn't really all that good at sales, and he started helping me to sell, sell better. And then I brought a projects guy in, and I was really good at projects, but he was better. So all of a sudden, I looked, and I had access to these people that were better at doing things than what I was. And instead of allowing my ego to feel intimidated by that, I took that as a blessing, because nobody can do it all. There's a lot of talk about you know, really famous entrepreneurs. Uh, Steve Jobs, rest his soul. Uh, Bezos, right? Uh, you, can, you can name a whole bunch of them. And everybody looks at them as like, wow, these guys are the most brilliant, you know, the saviors of the world. Well, the thing is, they're good in one of three spaces. They're either good at production, they're good at uh, marketing, or they're good at selling. None of them are good at all three. But what they're really good at is knowing what they're good at, knowing what they're weak, and then bringing other people in. So uh, that company I sold a week before its 21st birthday. We ended up getting to five and a half million dollars. I sold it to the management team that I brought in, and it's, uh, it's 32 years old this month. It's still going. And when I left that company, the reason I left it was because I was bored. And I knew there was something else for me. And once again, I'm thinking, why? You know, I just spent all this time building this company. Why do I want to leave? And what I knew was that there was something else for me. A lot of times, I don't know where I'm going. I just know where I don't want to be anymore. There's a lot of pressure about having goals. Set the goal. Achieve the goal. Go after the goal. Goals are great. But goals aren't the end all be all. Every goal you ever set, if you look back in your life, the ones that you've set, you've seen that when you have achieved them, you've kept on going. Like, nothing ended. Like, you know, yay, I, I won this. Yay, that doesn't end anything. So, when you look at your goals, they're important, but they're just guideposts. And there's going to be a lot of times you won't hit a goal. My goal with my first company was to take it forever and retire from it. Oh well, derailment, right? Okay, so now what? So what I had to look at with that was saying, you know what, okay, so my goal was really just a catalyst for me to go in a direction. And as I go in that direction, I pay attention every day to how are things going? Do I like it? Do I not like it? Do I want to keep going? Or was that an actual goal that I wanted to get? Or was that goal's job just to get me to another rung on the ladder where I could look and see, oh, I thought I wanted that, but now that I know what I learned from here, that looks really cool. So I, I want to go in that direction. We all have this, in, I call it the inner elder. We have the voice in our head that likes this, doesn't like that, criticizes this, wants that, it's all fine but it's, it's kind of our lower self, it's, it's ego driven. Inside each and every one of you and me is an inner elder. And that's the one that's really wise. And that's the one that shows up when you're about to hit send on that email. That's like maybe telling somebody, <laughs> and it goes, I don't know if I would do that. We hear the voice in our head so often, we think that's who we are. It's not, it's just what we're saying and what we're doing. It's important, but that's not your higher self. Your higher self is that thing in there, it's, it's, it's intuitive. It believes things about yourself that maybe your mind doesn't. And you wanna tap into that. Because when you tap into that, you'll start to tap into perseverance. The most important, one of the most important things you guys can tap into is perseverance. The slow boat always makes it to China. 
a glacier is perseverance. Slow, 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 but changes landscapes, moves mountains. Perseverance is one of the strongest forces we can have. It doesn't mean being foolish, but it means I'm, I'm going forward. And perseverance, in my experience, starts with me believing in myself. Because if I don't believe in myself, I don't have any place to push off of when things get hard, when things get challenging. In your world, you have everybody trying to control your mind. Social media, you have this group telling you this, you have that group telling you that, and you can watch it, see all these warring factions. It's low-level consciousness. It's human consciousness just kind of at its worst in many places. They're all in competition for your mind because if they can get their mind, they can get your support, they can get more people to support what their cause is as they go and look and, and do their thing. So get involved in whatever it is you want, but never give anybody your mind. To step back, question what they're doing, and wonder why. So, uh, after I sold that company, I'm now in the business of helping other companies to build their companies. So, somebody that never went to college, somebody that doesn't have an MBA, for the last 13 years I've been making a living going to small to medium sized businesses and helping them to build their company from where they were to where they want to go. And I'm really good at it. Because A, I've been in the trenches for a long time. B, I've, quote, failed miserably. That crash of that company made me so much better to, at doing what it is that I'm now doing than I ever could imagine. So I spent time uh, as a partner in a think tank, developing this new leadership paradigm and mindset that, that, that's in the book. Uh, I was a political strategist for a couple of years. Three governors have appointed me to boards and commissions. I built a, lawn, a large nonprofit. I've done all this stuff. And the way I did it was by gathering people together to help me get where we wanted to go. There were times I was sitting in meetings with governors and senators and stuff, and I was just like, what am I even doing here? And looking to build organizations and like, how, how, how am I ever going to get there? And the answer is, I'm not going to get there. We're going to get there. I learn from everybody all the time. I learn from experiences constantly. And when something happens, I say, what class am I in? Three years ago, uh, actually last week, I had my final treatment for stage four cancer. Okay. So stage four cancer, you want a learning experience? Take, well, don't take that ride. But <laughs> when that first hit me, once again, I had some, I had some real mind chatter. Like, whoa, you know, I've had some conversations with intimidating people like IRS, but never death, <laughs> you know? Like, whoa, what, what am I gonna do with this? And what I did with that was I said, okay, cancer is my teacher. What class am I in? Because I had to flip it. If I didn't take it as cancer is my teacher and I am in class, when I did that, that empowered me. I'm in the game. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I win. That was my mentality, I win. I don't know how, don't know what it's gonna look like, don't know what I'm gonna look like, but I win. If I wouldn't have done that, I would have had only one place to go, victim. You go into a victim mentality, you're gone. You're gone. If you get in it, get out of it. Because victim says that Life is happening to me and I don't have any control. What class am I in says I'm in the game. And one of the things about cancer, and any really major thing in your life, whether it's a, the loss of a loved one or you know, just anything at all that threatens just to make you collapse inward because there's some really heavy stuff out there, really intimidating, the first thing you ask yourself is what class am I in? Now you're not going to spring up and feel all great, but it's going to get you in that game. So perseverance, what class am I in? Uh, and respect everybody around you. Everybody has something to teach you. Everybody I've ever met knew something I didn't. And probably because I didn't have an academic background, uh, I really learned how to learn from other people. Uh, 
and I became really, really good at that. That's, that was the only way I could ever have done the political stuff. I didn't walk in there knowing that stuff. I went to people and said, I don't know anything, can you help me? That's, that's, that's one of the most uh, important attributes you can have when you're working somewhere. Is, <coughs> can you help me? And show up with respect. And my book's about consciousness, because leadership is, about, is a state of consciousness. It's not about, I'm the great guy, follow me. It's about understanding what the group that I'm working with is trying to accomplish. And how can I function in a way where you will look at me and respect me enough to give me the opportunity to influence your thinking. If maybe you've, you have a grandmother, or you have a parent, or you have an uncle, or you have a friend who's just kind of this person you go to, the mentor, right? They have a certain level of consciousness. They don't jump up and down and tell you to do all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you go to them because you trust how they think. Because when you show up to them, they're not talking just to hear themselves talk. They're in service of you. Leadership in this century is being of service to other people. And when you do that, people will start to follow you. Then you get all this collective genius, what I call the bigger no. I know what I know, you know what you know, and together we have a bigger no. It's a collective genius, a collective energy, and together we can accomplish so much stuff. And I'll close with this. Right now, one of the biggest things that's happening that's challenging is you hear all this knock on the millennials. Right? Millennials, yes, snowflakes, blah, blah, blah. Some of it's true. Some of it's BS. The challenge for you guys is to look to try to find those people you can learn from which will probably be a little bit easier for you. But the challenge for people who are my age, and I don't have gray hair, I'm an Arctic blonde, just, just for the record, right? <laughs> Arctic blondes, our challenge is to get past our arrogance and understand what you guys know that can really help us because you master technology. You can get stuff that I would take three hours, three days to do, and you could zip, 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 show me how I can get that done much quicker. So. As you lean in this way, a lot of what it is that I'm doing, talking with the audience that I'm talking with, is getting them to lean in this way. Because the world's getting really crazy. This technology stuff is wild. They have, what's, that, what's that stuff they call deep, whatever, where they're actually starting to be able to take a video of you saying something and completely re-digitize it and put different words in your mouth so it looks precisely like you have said something else. That is going to be a massively disruptive technology because some bad folks in some bad places can have either Donald Trump or Putin or anybody anywhere put a video out there and says, we think we should hit a button on Iran. I think they should, I think they should uh, make it illegal. I really do. Because that's not productive use of technology. Right? It's, got, it's gonna get some bad actors get their hands on that and it's gonna get wild. So we need to come together. We need to break down these false barriers of generations and all that kind of stuff because we all have the same basic level of consciousness and that's how you need to see people. See the human in the human and look to connect with them.